Hello, my name is Jason Danaher and this slideshow will present the concept, current design, and some important management strategies for an aquaponic production system. The pictures and drawings you will see are based upon the University of the Virgin Islands 30,000 gallon commercial scale raft aquaponic system, which has had more than 20 years of input into its research and design. I am assuming if you are viewing this presentation, you have heard about aquaponics, possibly have a hobby scale aquaponic system, or may be interested in scaling up to a larger production system. But if this is your first time with aquaponics, I still feel this presentation will be informative and not too complex to follow. So let's begin. Aquaponics is a hybrid system linking aquaculture, in this case the production of fish with hydroponics, which is the production of plants in a soilless environment. The concept of aquaponics is a relatively new science and came about because there has been pressure to improve freshwater use and decrease nutrient discharge to adjacent environments. Aquaponics is capable of addressing both issues. The aquaponic system is a recirculating aquaculture system reusing the majority of its water volume each day and the dissolved waste created by the fish are converted into a marketable hydroponic crop. The plants use the fish waste as a nutrient source, therefore cleaning the water and then the water returns back to the fish in a form that is not harmful for fish production. Managing an aquaponic system requires knowledge of both fish and plant production. Because there is a synergistic relationship between the fish and plants, choices in management can positively or negatively affect system production. Although tilapia eat algae, they will require a commercial diet because of the high stocking rates used in the aquaponic system. This diet provides all the essential nutrients for tilapia health and growth, and in addition supplies the plants with 95% of the nutrients required for their growth. Also, reliable energy is necessary to keep pumps and blowers running 24 hours a day throughout the year. In addition, the aquaponic system is an investment, requiring money to construct and operate the system until the production of plants and fish are ready for market and a sufficient amount of sales occur. This is an overhead view of the UVI aquaponic system. For this presentation, I'm going to present to you each of the system components, their function, and management strategies to ensure successful operation. My presentation will begin with the fish production tanks and work left to right in this diagram until we get to the hydroponic raceways. I will then show you how the water returns from the hydroponic raceways to the fish production tanks. Most of the aquaponic system components you will see are constructed from fiberglass. There are pros and cons to using different materials and it depends on what supplies are located in your area and the investment you want to make. The UVI system has four fiberglass fish production tanks. The approximate volume of each tank is 2,100 gallons. Each tank has a center drain where fish waste and uneaten feed can leave and enter into the filtration units which will be shown and discussed in upcoming slides. Each tank has an inlet where clean, filtered water that has passed through the filtration units and hydroponic plants returns to each tank at a flow rate of 25 gallons per minute. As you can see, the fish tanks are shaded under a hoop house with a shade cloth that blocks sunlight penetration. Preventing sunlight from entering the fish production area keeps algae from living in the aquaponic system. We do not want algae in the system because it will utilize nutrients required by the hydroponic plants and some forms of algae can block PVC pipes and the pump used to move water through the system. The fish pictured here is a Nile tilapia fingerling used for stocking in the fish tanks. Over the past decade tilapia has become popular in the United States as a food fish and of the dozen or so tilapia produced for aquaculture the Nile tilapia is the most commonly cultured around the world. Because the UVI system is located in a warm climate like the Caribbean, we are able to produce tilapia year-round in an outdoor system. In temperate climates, a greenhouse or insulated structure with heating would be necessary for tilapia production. Nile tilapia can handle adverse water quality conditions, crowding, and handling during production and harvest, while providing the producer with good growth rates and feed conversion ratios. This presentation will not go into depth addressing tilapia production. I urge you to speak with aquaculture extension specialists in your area, farmers, 
and to take advantage of a wealth of information regarding the production of this warm water fish available online. For the aquaponic system, the management strategy for tilapia production is to stagger the fish production tanks. Staggered production is a benefit because it results in regular harvest for market, but relies on a consistent supply of tilapia fingerlings. The staggered production also creates a steady supply of nutrients for the hydroponic plants throughout the year. Every six weeks, a specific tank in the system is harvested and restocked with fingerlings. Over a one-year period, each tank is harvested twice. The fish stocked into the tank are sex-reversed at a young age to produce male fingerlings. Male tilapia are preferred because they grow faster than females, and single-sex populations prevent reproduction from occurring in the system. After 24 weeks in the tank, the fish are harvested with a final individual weight of approximately 1.5 pounds and a survival rate greater than 95%. Towards final harvest, fish biomass can approach 1.5 pound per gallon. We use a 32% protein tilapia diet and feed it to the fish three times each day. Our feeding method is called ad libitum, which is a fancy way of saying we feed the fish all they will eat within a 30 minute time period at each feeding. A common feed conversion ratio for our aquaponic system is 1.5 to 1.7. One of the key concepts for the aquaponic system is maintaining a proper ratio of the tilapia feeding rate to the hydroponic growing area. We recommend 60 to 100 grams of tilapia feed per meter squared of hydroponic growing area per day. This equates to approximately 30 to 50 pounds of feed per day for the entire system. Small experiments have shown a feeding rate greater than 100 grams of feed per meter squared of hydroponic growing area per day is possible. But 60 to 100 grams minimizes concerns with water quality management. Also, each fish tank contains 22 air stones, which allow the atmospheric air, the same air you and I breathe, to enter the tank and provide sufficient oxygen for the fish. The air is pushed into the system by a 1.5 horsepower regenerative blower. This slide demonstrates what is meant by staggered production and the rotation of harvesting and stocking each fish tank. At the beginning, tank 1 is stocked with tilapia fingerlings. Six weeks later, tank 2 is stocked with tilapia fingerlings. Then, six weeks after tank 2 is stocked, we would stock tank 3 with tilapia fingerlings. Finally, tank 4 is stocked with tilapia six weeks after stocking tank 3. Now, each tank has fish, but remember, the age and size of fish in each tank is different. At this time, the fish in tank 1 are 18 weeks older than tank 4, and tank 1 is nearly ready for harvest. After 24 weeks, tank 1 is ready to harvest. Once it is harvested, it is restocked with a new batch of tilapia. Six weeks later, tank 2 is harvested and restocked with tilapia fingerlings. This cycle continues as long as the aquaponic system is in production. You may be wondering how would a farmer harvest and restock each individual tank without disrupting the rest of the aquaponic production system. First you need to unplug the main pump which delivers water from the sump to the fish tanks. Then cap the effluent line for tank 1 where it enters the clarifier to prevent backflow. With the pump shut off and the drain line capped, tank 1 is now isolated. Next you can drop in a submersible pump and place the hose outlet in any fish tank. Here we place the outlet in the tank 3. The submersible pump draws the water down in tank 1 so the fish can be netted out. The water from tank 1 is distributed to the extra freeboard located in the aquaponic system. Therefore, no water and no nutrients is wasted to harvest the tilapia. To restock tank 1, first remove the submersible pump and turn the main pump on for the aquaponic system. Once tank 1 is half full, add the tilapia fingerlings and continue filling the tank. Don't forget to remove the cap from the clarifier once tank 1 has been filled again. Here's a photo of a market-sized Nile tilapia that weighs approximately 1.5 pounds 
and measures 12 to 13 inches in length. The picture to the right shows how the feed floats once it is added to the tank. This allows the farmer to observe the fish eating the feed. If they don't finish all the feed in a 30 minute period, the farmer will want to decrease the next feeding accordingly. If they finish all the feed within a 30 minute feeding, the farmer will want to bump the feeding rate up a little. The general rule of thumb is if the fish finish all the feed within a 30 minute feeding, then the water quality and fish health is good. If the fish do not consistently finish the feed over three to four consecutive feeding periods, and you have tried to adjust the feeding rate accordingly, then feeding should cease and water quality and fish health should be checked. Okay, now we're getting away from the fish production units and are moving on to the next system component. After the fish tanks, the dirty water flows into the cone bottom clarifier. Its main function is to remove large solid waste from the production system. It cannot remove dissolved fish waste such as ammonia and nitrite. The clarifier allows solids to settle out of the culture water for discharge. There are two clarifiers for the aquaponic system and each clarifier services two fish production tanks. You can see the two separate PVC lines entering the clarifier on the left. Each of these lines is plumbed into a center drain that transports solid waste from the fish tanks into the clarifier. It is key the water entering the 1,000 gallon clarifier is allowed to remain for 20 minutes to remove the large waste particles. The flow rate entering the clarifier is 50 gallons per minute. The clarifier has a cone bottom and the solids concentrate in the cone for removal two to three times each day. This slide shows a cross-sectional view of the clarifier and how it functions. You can see dirty water entering the clarifier on the left and hitting a baffled wall. The baffled wall slows the water velocity down and allows solids to settle out to the cone bottom. As the water passes through the clarifier, the large particles are removed, but small, suspended particles are able to escape the clarifier and pass on to the net tanks. This is a photo of the concentrated sludge that is discharged from the clarifier two to three times daily. This sludge can have a solids content as high as 2% and the effluent makes its way to a storage site adjacent to the production system. This nutrient sludge should not go into the hydroponic raceways. It will create an environment that is lethal to plants and the sustainability of the production system. However, this effluent makes a great fertilizer for potted plants and raised beds. This effluent has a low MPK value and is a slow release organic fertilizer so it can be applied daily without harming the plants. These are the net tanks that come after the clarifier. Their main function is to capture and contain the suspended solids which have left the clarifier. They are able to do this because each net tank contains approximately 50 feet of orchard netting. In addition, as solids build up in the orchard netting, nutrients are released in a dissolved form which the hydroponic plants can better utilize. We have found the frequency of cleaning the net tanks affects the nitrate concentration in the aquaponic system. Because of low oxygen conditions in the net tank area, nitrate can be removed from the system. Therefore, to maintain high levels of nitrate, we recommend cleaning the net tanks two times each week. To maintain lower levels of nitrate, clean the net tanks one time per week. Your type of hydroponic crop and the growth stage of your hydroponic crop will determine what levels of nitrate are desirable. In general, leafy greens prefer high levels of nitrate, whereas fruiting crops may not set fruit properly if nitrate levels are too high. Here is a cross-sectional view of how the orchard netting in each net tank captures the suspended solids. As the solids are captured, they are broken down mechanically and biologically, which releases dissolved nutrients into the water for the hydroponic plants. Again, 
Washing the orchard netting is important to maintain proper water quality for your aquaponic system. Specifically, it can affect nitrate levels. Some pretty extravagant cleaning devices have been designed to clean the orchard netting. The unit seen here uses two power washing heads to knock off solid matter. However, a simple garden hose with a pistol grip is sufficient. From experience, I can guarantee you that regardless of your cleaning device, you will get messy doing this procedure. It's probably the least liked routine concerning the aquaponic system. It is for this reason alternative filtration devices have been researched and should continue to be investigated. The dirty water washed from the nets also makes its way to the effluent storage area adjacent to the system. The degassing tank comes after the net tanks and is where the system water converges after the filtration units. Its location is just before the hydroponic raceways. The degassing tank receives its name because there are several air stones vigorously aerating the water as it enters. This vigorous aeration uplifts the water into three distribution pipes which supply the three sets of hydroponic raceways. Also, the aeration blows off any hydrogen sulfide that may be present from the low oxygen in the clarifier and net tanks and re also removes excess nitrogen gas. Also within this area is our last defense for capturing and preventing baby tilapia from entering the hydroponic raceways. As water enters the, the degassing tank it must first pass through nets with mesh size similar to window screening. Every day these nets are removed and immediately replaced with a second set and then washed. If baby tilapia are able to enter the hydroponic raceway they will consume the plant roots and plant production noticeably decreases. Although we stock sex reverse fish this sex reversal process is only 95 percent effective so occasionally some fish reproduction will occur. The aquaponic system has six raceways with a total plant growing area of 214 square meters. The raceways are paired, therefore there are three sets. Each raceway is constructed of eight inch cinder blocks stacked two cinder blocks high and reinforced with concrete. A low density polyethylene food grade liner is used to prevent water from escaping. Each wall of the raceway is 16 inches high. However, the actual depth of water in the raceway is approximately 12 to 14 inches. The polystyrene rafts are painted white with a non-toxic paint to increase their life when exposed to the sun's ultraviolet light. We call the polystyrene sheets our floating fields because this is what the hydroponic plants are growing on. The plant roots require oxygen and a one horsepower blower provides the plants with atmospheric oxygen. The water makes its way down one raceway and into its partnered raceway constantly. It takes about three hours for the water to travel each set of hydroponic raceways and return to the fish culture tanks. Here you can see how the water makes its way through a pair of raceways. The colored arrows denote the difference between the paired raceways, but the flow of the water is the same. Water enters at the far side where the degassing tank is located. It travels down the raceway that it enters and when it reaches the end it passes underground through PVC piping and into the second raceway to travel back to the fish production unit. Most of the plants cultured in the hydroponic system are first started in soilless media in a greenhouse for a three to four week period and later transferred to the raceway. The transplant plugs are placed into plastic net pots like the one pictured. Circular holes are cut into each polystyrene sheet which allow the net pot to be inserted and make contact with the water. Plant roots begin to grow out of the net pot and into the hydroponic environment in search of nutrients. The roots are able to absorb nutrients in the hydroponic environment and there is a continuous supply of nutrients 24 hours a day until harvest.
Once the water has traveled through the hydroponic component of the system, it may return to the fish culture tanks. All the water that leaves each set of hydroponic raceways returns to the sump. The sump is the lowest point in the production system. Water flows by gravity from the fish tanks all the way to the hydroponic raceways and later to the sump. But an electrical pump is required to efficiently push water up and into the fish tanks. The sump is also the site for controlling pH and adding additional water due to evaporation, plant transpiration, and waste removal. A float valve helps set the water level. The base addition tank is adjacent to the sump and is where chemical addition occurs to maintain a neutral water pH of 7.0. It trickles water into the sump to slowly increase pH. We don't want a sudden change in pH because it can shock the fish and plants, even causing mortality in some instances. In this photo you can also see the pump which delivers water from the sump to the fish production tanks. It is capable of pumping 100 gallons per minute and therefore can distribute water at a rate of 25 gallons per minute to each fish tank. Each fish tank has a ball valve at its inlet to further adjust water flow if necessary. Measuring the pH allows the farmer to determine if the culture water is ideal for the biological processes occurring in the aquaponic system. So maintaining the pH of the aquaponic system is important. Because the system contains fish, plants, and nitrifying bacteria which help to convert the fish waste ammonia into nitrate, we need to meet in a middle ground for what each organism prefers. Maintaining the pH at 7.0 is optimal for fish, plants, and bacteria. Due to the biological and chemical processes occurring in the system, the pH will want to continuously drop below 7.0. We alternate the addition of potassium hydroxide and calcium hydroxide to maintain the pH at 7.0. Besides maintaining the proper pH, each base provides essential nutrients like calcium and potassium for the plants. On the left is calcium hydroxide, which comes in a powdered form. On the right is potassium hydroxide, which can be bought as pearls or flakes. Both chemicals are considered caustic and should be handled according to their label and material safety data sheet. However, when used properly, they are very effective in managing water quality in the aquaponic system. When pH begins to fall below 7.0, we will add approximately 2 pounds of either calcium hydroxide or, or potassium hydroxide per day to the base addition tank until pH reaches 7.0 again. I have seen some blog sites that criticize UVI for using these bases in the aquaponic system. They are commonly used in other agricultural production systems and are effective when used properly. Just make sure the addition is a gradual process which is why we use the base addition tank and that the employees handle them with care. Now that you have seen each component in the order that the water flows through the system, I'd like to show you some CAD drawings that demonstrate the layout and plumbing of the system. This slide shows a three-dimensional overview of the current aquaponic system. The gray grid we are peering down through is the metal hoop house or cold frame that provides a structure to shade out the sunlight. Let's get oriented with the rest of the system components. The red circular tanks are the fish production tanks. The brown circular tanks are the clarifiers. The yellow rectangular tanks are the net tanks, and the blue rectangular tank is a degassing tank. At the bottom, the green rectangular tanks are the hydroponic raceways, and the purple tanks in the center are the sump, base addition tank, and pump. Adjacent to the hoop house is the effluent storage, which holds the waste discharge from the clarifiers and net tanks. This is an additional overhead view of the aquaponic system. To the top right, you can see where the regenerative blowers for the fish and plant components are located. The previous slide and this current one provide a nice 3D overhead view of the system. But the important part that oftentimes is difficult for individuals to understand is the underground plumbing and how the plumbing connects one component to the next. So let's take a look from the bottom up.
Now, let's imagine we are underground and lying on our backs. We are looking up and at the bottom of the aquaponics system. From this view, we can see quite a bit of the plumbing that would be invisible from the surface. We can see how the, each fish tank has a center drain and is plumbed into the clarifier. We can also see how the water is returned from the sump to the fish tanks. We can see the comb bottom of the clarifier and how the effluent is able to leave the clarifier and travel to the surface for discharge. In addition, the purple tubing is a water distribution system for the hydroponic tanks. The next slide will demonstrate the clarifier and hydroponic system a little better. From this view, we can better see how the water would leave the degassing tank and enter into each pair of hydroponic raceways. After traveling through the hydroponic raceway, we can see how the water exits each pair of raceways and returns to the sump. Finally, we can see how the effluent would leave each clarifier and travel out to the effluent storage pond. Now I'm going to cover some of the very basic requirements your hydroponic plants will need. First of all is light. Plants require adequate natural lighting or artificial lighting for proper growth. So ensure that your hydroponic tanks are positioned to allow maximum exposure to natural lighting in your area. Plant roots require oxygen. If the area they are grown in lacks sufficient oxygen, then the roots will die and the crop is lost. Temperature is important. Just like any biological organism, plants require the proper temperature. If plants are produced indoors, then ventilation and heating will be required. Outdoor production is dependent on the ambient air temperature, just like traditional horticulture. Depending on the crop, spacing is important to reduce competition for light and allow air movement. Also, protect, protection from wind and monitoring the plants for pests are important for plant health and production. Regarding nutrients, there are 16 essential nutrients plants require. The actual concentration can be different depending on the type of plant produced, but nonetheless, the plant requires the macronutrients nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, sulfur, and magnesium, and micronutrients boron, chloride, copper, iron, molybdenum, manganese, and zinc. If you were to speak to a hydroponic producer, an aquaponic producer, you would soon see that the recommended ranges for the same hydroponic plants are quite different. In hydroponics, the original, the original nutrient solution is created and over time the macronutrient and micronutrient concentrations are reduced as the plants absorb nutrients for growth. After a period of time, the hydroponic nutrient solution must be thrown out or additional nutrients added to maintain plant growth. With aquaponics, the nutrient solution is always being created for the plants. Each day we feed the fish and wastes are created. A consistent and low concentration of nutrients is always available for the plants to extract for growth. This table compares a typical nutrient concentration between aquaponics and hydroponics. You can see the aquaponic nutrient concentration is below the recommended hydroponic concentration throughout the list. Again, what is unique about aquaponics and why it works is the fact nutrients are being added to the system daily in the form of fish feed and the fish wastes provide the majority of the plant nutrients. On the other hand, hydroponics begins with a high nutrient concentration and anticipates the nutrient concentration will decrease over time. After a period of time, the hydroponic solution must be replaced. The main idea behind aquaponics is the fish waste provides nutrients for the hydroponic crop. The fish waste does provide the majority of the plant nutrients, but the fish waste lacks sufficient calcium, potassium, and iron to sustain plant health. 
therefore sources of calcium, potassium, and iron are added. If you remember, calcium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide are added to the system to maintain a pH of 7.0. When these bases are added to the system, calcium and potassium are supplemented as well. We end up killing two birds with one stone. The iron is added in a chelated form every three weeks or is needed to maintain a sufficient iron concentration. A chelated form ensures the iron is available for plant uptake and does not precipitate out of the water. The iron can be added to the degassing tank to quickly introduce it to the hydroponic troughs. There are two types of plant production methods that can be used in the aquaponic system. We call them batch culture and staggered production. With batch culture, the whole hydroponic component, meaning all the raceways, are planted at the same time with the same age seedlings. When the plants are ready for harvest, all the plants are, re are removed from the system for market, and then the whole system is replanted again. One advantage to this production technique is a large market can be supplied monthly with lettuce. However, a disadvantage is as the plant biomass peaks, the nutrient concentration in the system is depleted, and the potential for plant nutrient deficiencies can increase. At UVI, we recommend staggered production for most scenarios. Just like the fish production, staggered plant production allows for regular harvest on a smaller scale. This prevents nutrient depletion, but requires a good management protocol to ensure plant seedlings are ready for weekly transplanting. This diagram demonstrates staggered production with a hydroponic component. The different colors represent a plant, say lettuce, at different developmental stages. Going from left to right, the blue would be the youngest, green intermediate age, and yellow the oldest and ready for market. I want to show you how a farmer would harvest the older, here the yellow portion, of the raceways for market. This would require two people to lift the polystyrene sheet out of the water, one at a time, and harvest the lettuce. Then the workers would go down to the blue rafts and push the remaining rafts down to the end of the raceway. After cleaning any leaf debris off the yellow rafts, they can be taken to the opposite end of the raceway, insert clean plastic cups, and replant with new three to four week old transplants. As you can see, the floating fields are easy to handle and rearrange. If you have ever read other aquaponic and or hydroponic literature or viewed other hydroponic farms, you probably have seen lettuce production. Lettuce is a very common crop for hydroponics and there is a big demand for fresh and fancy lettuce heads by people involved in the culinary and retail business. Before lettuce is transplanted into the aquaponic system, it must first have a four week start in the greenhouse or shade house to ensure adequate size for transplant and survival in an outdoor aquaponic system and climate like we have at UVI. Seedlings are grown in a soilless mixture of cocoa fiber and vermiculite and twice a week are provided with a water soluble inorganic fertilizer. Other farmers may recommend another management technique but we found this works best for us. You can see depending on the type of lettuce head you're trying to produce the average weight and number of plants per raft may change. A pattern with the correct quantity of holes and spacing is cut out of a quarter inch sheet of plywood and used to ensure all poly polystyrene sheets are identical for lettuce varieties requiring 48, 60, or 88 heads per sheet. Basil is another popular crop for hydroponics. When the plant is ready to harvest, you don't necessarily have to harvest the whole plant and remove it from the system. Depending on your market, you may cut off sections from each plant and allow it to regrow. We call this cut and come again. This reduces your space required to nurse transplants and some work associated with cleaning polystyrene sheets between crops. However, 
Eventually the plant will begin to die back, usually at the roots. When the roots begin to turn a dark brown, it is best to remove the whole plant and begin with new transplants. Some other crops that hold potential for aquaponics are mint and chives. Both mint and chives can be a cut and come again crop. You can snip sections of the mint and cut the green tops of the chives for market. Also, the two inch plastic cups make for an easy way to harvest a nice bunch of chives for market. And replanting is simple. Simply break one bulb off and place it in an empty net pot. However, it takes a while for chives to reestablish as a cluster in our raft system and additional research would be necessary. However, other types of aquaponic systems have successfully grown chives. Cucumbers do well in the aquaponic system. Of course, there's plenty of water for the cucumber plant. Since we have an outdoor system and are not really limited with horizontal space, we allow our plants to grow out and over the raceway. But, in a temperate climate where a greenhouse structure is used, trellising the plants to maximize use of vertical space would be preferred. Collard greens and pak choy also do well in the system. An aquaponic system has the potential to allow a farmer to sell quality produce to niche markets for a growing ethnic population in the United States. Oriental vegetables have good potential in an aquaponic system. This is water spinach. It has no relationship to ordinary spinach, but is closely related to sweet potato. Water spinach grows vigorously in an aquaponic system. The shoots and leaves are edible and are a staple product for Asian cuisine. This is another cut and come again crop that will easily regrow in a matter of a couple of weeks. It can be easily established with cuttings. This plant has potential, but is listed as an invasive species in many southern states although it cannot withstand frost. You'll have to check with your state regarding the production of this crop. Cut flowers and cantaloupes have done well in the system. The sugar content of cantaloupes and melons can vary because of the growing environment. In field production, the fruit begins to sweeten when the vine dies back in water stress conditions. However, in the aquaponic system, water is always present and the vine never really dies back, so the sugar content of the melon may not reach its maximum potential. If you were to perform a bricks test on the fruit, you may observe this. However, on a hot, humid summer day in the Virgin Islands, it is always nice to take a 15 minute break and share half a cantaloupe with a co-worker. Managing pests is important for the success of a hydroponic crop. Plants are crowded up to a point that maximizes production per unit area, which makes it easier for pests to damage a crop. But the mere presence of a pest doesn't necessarily indicate there is a problem. Knowing what insects will attack your crop and what environment, for example temperature, time of year, the humidity, the pest or pathogen prefers will assist in preventing an outbreak. With an integrated system like aquaponics, you have to be careful in choosing what pesticides to use because you do not want to affect your fish or beneficial bacterial population. This slide has three biological controls we use in the aquaponic system. Dipel is a naturally occurring bacteria. It controls many leaf-eating caterpillars of moths and butterflies, but it does not harm other insects, birds, fish, or warm-blooded animals. Dipel does not kill caterpillars immediately, and once a caterpillar eats treated foliage, Although it stops eating, it may take up to three to four days to die and drop from the leaf. Botanigard contains live spores of a naturally occurring parasitic fungus. After an application of Botanigard, the spores will contact and adhere to the target insect. Within hours, the spores will germinate, penetrating the cuticle or skin of the insect. The fungus grows within the insect body, overwhelming and killing the insect. The spores do not affect other organisms like humans, pets, birds, and other animals. Armicarb is a broad-spectrum contact foiler fungicide. It 
controls a variety of agricultural crop diseases such as powdery mildew. The use of soaps and oils prevent certain pests from destroying your crop as well. By coating the insect's body or making contact with the insect's body, the soap or oil results in insect death. Soaps and oils are a broad spectrum control and may affect other beneficial insects in the area you are spraying. None of the biological controls or soaps and oils shown here result in total eradication of the pests. Continual use is required to maintain control of pest populations once they have reached an economic threshold in your crop. I would like to quickly share some best management practices for pest management. It is important to note that often the pests or disease is present in the production area, but when the pathogen, host, and correct environment converge, that's when a problem is going to occur. So prevention through proper system management is your best option in controlling pests. In regards to integrated pest management, areas for pest breeding and refuge should be eliminated from your production areas. Good sanitation practices should be used in, in and around the production and nursery area to minimize weeds, insects, and pathogens. Periodic scouting should be used to determine when pest problems reach the economic threshold. The least environmentally persistent, toxic, and or mobile pesticides are used and rotated to prevent the buildup of insect tolerance. And records are kept on past pest problems, pesticide use, and other information for each plant production area. For pesticide management, read the pesticide label and use proper clothing and protection for application. Make sure all pesticide application equipment is maintained and calibrated on a regular basis. Make sure only the amount of pesticide needed is mixed for application and pesticides are stored in their original container and in a proper properly designed facility that is equipped with warning signs. Finally, notify employees when pesticides have been applied and when it is okay to re-enter the production area. A good time to spray may be at the end of the workday when employees have returned home. Pythium is a problem for hydroponic crops and affects the roots resulting in stunted plants. When Pythium attacks plant roots, there is a noticeable change in appearance from nice white roots to brown decaying roots in heavily affected plants. There are microorganisms and chemicals that are said to control pythium in hydroponic operations, but to this day I don't believe they are labeled for use in an integrated system like aquaponics. Temperature is usually the factor that activates the pythium at UVI. It is present in our system throughout the year, but is seasonal with high plant mortality occurring in the warmer months. Not using peat-based media for seedlings and cleaning equipment with a 10% bleach solution can help to prevent introduction in an enclosed system. If you have an outdoor system like UVI, you are more than likely going to get pythium from the surrounding environment. Although it's not the end of the world, be aware when pythium may strike and try to plant resistant varieties. It is important to note that once a year each raceway should be drained and all organic matter from decayed plants be removed. This decaying matter can be a refuge for problems like pythium and other plant diseases. Snails can be problematic in an aquaponic system because they will consume the film of nitrifying bacteria growing on the surfaces of the hydroponic raceways. This can have an effect on your water quality. Snails can also be vectors for fish disease. You do not want to add copper sulfate to the system to control snails. You'll end up killing your vegetable crop. One biological control option is red ear sunfish, which can be stocked in the hydroponic raceway to control snail infestations. Unlike tilapia, the red ear sunfish will not consume plant roots. Finally, here's a summary of important concepts to remember concerning the aquaponic system. Staggering your fish production allows for a constant supply of nutrients with little fluctuation in nutrient concentration. Staggering your hydroponic crop results in a steady nutrient uptake without leading to plant nutrient deficiencies.
Feeding the equivalent of 60 to 100 grams per square meter of plant growing area per day helps to maintain a balanced system and minimizes water quality problems. This range is sufficient for both fish and plant production. If you're interested in designing your own raft aquaponic system, I would start with a simple ratio and calculate fish and plant production based on it. Cleaning your net tanks will affect the amount of nitrate in the system. For higher levels of nitrate, clean the nets twice per week, and for lower levels, clean once per week. The addition of calcium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide when pH falls below 7.0 helps to neutralize the pH and raise it to 7.0 again. The addition of these bases also supplements the system with calcium and potassium, which are two limiting plant nutrients that are not supplied in enough quantity solely by the fish waste. Finally, scout and keep records of when your plants were affected by certain pests and what pesticide was effective in controlling the pest population. And remember to read the pesticide label and apply the pesticide according to the directions provided. Here's a photo with some of the UVI team members after a recent harvest from the aquaponic system. There is a farm store on campus where the fish and vegetables produced by the aquaculture program can be sold to the public. And no, the cantaloupes and watermelons do not taste like fish. You would not believe how many times visitors ask that question. If you are new to aquaculture, I would recommend you investigate other sources to expand your knowledge of tilapia production and recirculating systems. Additional information is located at the Southern Regional Aquaculture Center's website. This slide contains hyperlinks so you should be able to click on them and they will take you directly to the information. The aquaponic fact sheet has additional information regarding the size of PVC piping used throughout the system. Also, there is a site for the University of the Virgin Islands Aquaculture Program. The program does offer a short course and additional information may be obtained by contacting program staff. If you are interested in getting more in-depth knowledge of tilapia culture, hydroponic plant production, and recirculating aquaculture systems, I would recommend reading the following text. All these books will supply you with extensive knowledge of the topic area and are written by experts in their field of science. I would like to thank Dr. James Ricosi, Donald Bailey, and Charlie Schultz for sharing their knowledge of aquaponics during my five years at the University of the Virgin Islands. Combined, they have over 65 years of experience with aquaponics. I would also like to give a special thank you to Rodolfo Castillo for allowing me to use his CAD drawings of the aquaponic system. Rodolfo completed the UVI short course and shortly after he returned home to build and operate his business Aquaponicos de El Salvador in La Libertad, El Salvador. Thank you Rodolfo. And finally I want to thank the audience for viewing this presentation. I hope it was informative and I hope it helped you to better understand how integrated aquaculture systems like aquaponics will help to sustain food production for future generations.